Okay, welcome back. Hope everyone had a great spring break. Um, although it kind of feels like spring break is going to be continuing for a while, except now there are some videos to watch. Um, so, anyways, um, I'm getting to live my lifelong dream of um, running lectures in my pajamas. Um, I never thought the university would let me do this, but turns out there are certain circumstances when lecturing in your pajamas is okay. So, let's go ahead and get started. So, I want to talk about is alkene addition reactions. We sort of briefly covered these on last Friday. But essentially, what it is, is remember the E1 reaction is a reversible reaction. And so that means if you take these materials in the conditions together, you can actually drive the reaction backwards. Or if you add a catalytic amount of, of acid and water to this alkene, you can successfully do it like that. And the mechanism is purely the reverse of the E1 reaction. So this top reaction is called the E1. This reaction here is called an alkene addition reaction. And so you start off this reaction by protonating the alkene. Now, there are two carbons that you can protonate. If you protonate the right-hand carbon, you get this carbocation right here. This CH2 has become a CH3. So whatever carbon gets the proton, the other carbon gets the carbocation because the electrons are going from one carbon away from one to grab that hydrogen. Now if you protonated the other carbon, you get this carbocation. Now, tertiary carbocations are better than primary carbocations. So the top part is favored, this part is disfavored. So the carbocation goes on the more substituted carbon. And then the nucleophile adds to that. And we click proton transfer, and we are at our product.
In these alkene addition reactions, the proton goes on less substituted carbon. Nucleophile goes to the most substituted carbon. This is what is referred to as Markovnikov. addition. Now, you don't necessarily have to use acid and water on it. These alkene reactions can also work in cases of adding HX or X is Cl, Br, or I. Hydrofluoric acid, HF, isn't that acidic, so it's, it's very unlikely that it will add a crust and alkene. Chloride, bromide, and iodide, hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, and I tried like acid, a quite acidic, capable of protonating an alkene. Now, if you notice, there's a subtle difference between adding HX and catalytic amount of sulfuric acid and an oxygen nucleophile. It's the catalytic amount. In the reaction involving acid and water, in that last step, we're regenerating the acid. So as a result, you need just a little bit of acid to get this reaction to go. In the case of adding HCl, HBr, or HI across an alkene, you need a stoichiometric amount of acid because when you do the reaction, the acid is actually consumed and is not regenerated. Now, we are basing everything off of substitution because you want to protonate to form the most stable carbocation you can. So say you have a molecule like this, and HBr across that. Go ahead and pause this as you work out the products. Turns out, each of these carbons are equally substituted. Both are secondary carbons, and so they will both end up getting an H and a Br. Meaning that if we put the H, let's say, let's call this carbon 1 and carbon 2, if we put the H on carbon 1, that means carbon 2 gets the Br. But if we put the H on carbon 2, That means carbon 1 gets the Br. Now, the carbocation that's used, say when you protonate carbon 1, it is achiral. The starting material alkene is achiral. The bromide can add from the top or the bottom, in which case, you have two possibilities of isomers. 
Same way if you protonate carbon 2 and the bromine goes on carbon 1. And so we get four possibilities of molecules. A, B, C, and D. A and C are constitutional isomers because they have different connectivity. Therefore, we have to write them both. A and B, on the other hand, if you look, same connectivity, different, um, same interatom distances. The only difference is you have one chiral center and it flips from one to the other. Therefore, A and B are enantiomers. Since they are enantiomers, we draw one of them. I'll choose to draw A and write racemic. Now, if we take a look at C and D, it looks very similar to the previous case, except that is not a chiral center. So it doesn't matter if that bromine is a wedge or a dash because those two molecules happen to be the same molecule. And so we just draw one of those. And I'll just draw that. And so the answer to this problem is these two molecules. Okay. Reactions of carbocations. Say you take propylene. Add in just a catalytic amount of acid. What do you get? Notice, I don't have another nucleophile present. All I have is propylene and a catalytic amount of acid right there. So, the mechanism. We protonate to form the most stable carbocation we can. Now that's an electrophile. It's looking for a nucleophile. And there's not another nucleophile that's readily present. So as a result, this molecule does something else. This is akin to um, what the instructor that taught me um, described it as, imagine that a carbocation is a shrew. Yeah, small little mouse-like mammal. And if you take a box of shrews and leave them over the weekend with no food or water, what you come back to is just one really big shrew. Yeah, he was a very twisted individual, the guy that instructed me, and I guess I'm sore twisted myself. What I mean by that is you have this carbocation right here. There's not another nucleophile present that, can, that that carbocation can feed on. But what you do have is more of the alkenes. This carbocation, you can think of as a rather large proton. And so it can react just like as the acid. And so the electrons from the alkene can go to that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to color code these carbons blue. And this is not very likely to be reversible because we are making a carbon-carbon bond.
and you get a new carbocation right there. If I was to number these carbons, be one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, four, five, and six. And then we get a larger carbocation. That carbocation right there adds another alkene, and I'm going to add this like so. Again, this is not readily reversible at all. And so if we were to number these, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, seven, eight, nine. Get a new carbocation right there. And this process goes on and on and on and on until you get basically these rather large molecules like this called polymers. These polymers are repeating units of the same thing over and over again thousands and thousands of times. This particular polymer, since our starting material is propylene, this is polypropylene, which is used in a lot of, of plastics, such as plastic bottles, that kind of thing. Now, this is a very simplistic way of doing this, but this is what is called cationic polymerization. And catalysts have been developed for this type of polymerization. If you notice, there are technically stereochemistry at each of these sites. And if you use the right um, catalyst, you can actually control whether these are wedges or dashes. You can have them be all wedges or have them alternate wedge, dash, wedge, dash. And you can get different properties based off of that and they typically use Lewis acid catalysts to this. And this type of poly polymerization when you're using a specialized Lewis catalyst is often referred to as ziegler natta polymerization. If you want more information on this, you can um, Google that, um, but we're not going to cover anything more on the Ziegler Nata system. But it's a very popular way, very inexpensive way of making polymers and plastic that we use in everyday society. Now, a second reaction of alkenes, or not of alkenes, I should say, of carbocations. Excuse me, need to take a little break and get some Dr. Pepper down. Okay. All better now. Here's a dirty little secret of carbocations. They can, what are called, rearrange. If you take this alkene and add HBr to it,
you might be tempted to draw this as a product. And since it's chiral, going from a chiral to chiral, you get a racemic mixture. Turns out this is the minor product of this reaction. The major product would be this product right here. Now this one isn't racemic because the molecule is a chiral. The way this works, it has to do with the reason why tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondaries, and secondaries are more stable than primaries, and so forth. That has to do with hyperconjugation. So if we look at, say, the carbocation intermediate of this, Get the secondary carbocation. If I was to draw this sort of a side view of this, Here's the carbocation, has an empty p orbital. And what's partially stabilizing this carbocation is hyperconjugation. That's the idea of the electrons in a neighboring sp bond or hybrid um, bonding orbital. So we have electrons in this sp3 carbon hydrogen bond right here. It's sucking the electron density into that. That helps stabilize this carbocation. Well, thing is, secondary carbocations are very high in energy. It might not be content with just borrowing, borrowing some of the electron density from the carbon-hydrogen bond, what can happen is it can take all of the electron density. And the hydrogen can shift over to there. Now, look very closely at how that arrow is drawn. It looks like we're moving the plus charge over to here, but we don't draw the arrow like this. We draw the arrow like this because, remember, curved arrows are showing electrons. Now, carbocation doesn't have any electrons. What we're showing is this carbon here starts out as a CH and this hydrogen right here, its electrons with the hydrogen are sliding over form CH2. What that does is it creates a new carbocation on the adjacent carbon. And this carbocation is what the bromide attacks. Well, 
like so. So this is an, an, an example of a carbocation rearrangement. And all carbocations technically can rearrange. For a carbocation to rearrange, you need a driving force. What I mean by that is The molecule must become more stable somehow, such as a secondary carbocation becomes a tertiary carbocation, or a tertiary carbocation becomes a resonant stabilized carbocation. Other reasons could be you can alleviate ring strain. Say you have a four membered ring, and if it rearranges, it forms a five membered ring that molecule has become more stable. As a result of this, because of this driving force, primary carbocations rearrange quickly, but the problem is you need to be able to form a primary carbocation first. Secondary carbocations are more common because they are easier to form than primary carbocations, yet are quite unstable and therefore will rapidly rearrange. So you'll see a lot of rearrangements with secondary carbocations. Tertiary carbocations, well tertiary carbocations are pretty happy when, by the start. So they have a tendency to rearrange slowly because typically they are the stable carbocation as it is. Now, one last thing about rearrangement. 
is you move one group from the beta carbon to the alpha carbon. Typically, the group that's moved is a hydrogen or a carbon group. Other atoms can rearrange, but they are less likely to. They end up going often through a different mechanism of rearrangement. So typically with your your rearrangement, it's either going to be a hydrogen or a carbon group. So this molecule right here if you just heat it up you'll cause this Well, if we take a look at our starting molecule, we have a good leaving group. It's attached to an sp3 carbon. We're looking at SN1 and E1 possibilities and E2. SN2 is not possible. It's highly unlikely because the beta carbon right here is quaternary. Now we don't have any other reactant present. Well, for trying to figure out what's going on in this mechanism, it's not E1 or E2 because we don't have an alkene in the product. All we've done is move the bromine around. So we're looking at something akin to an SN1 reaction. In an SN1 reaction, the leaving group leaves. forms a carbocation. That carbocation is secondary. Watch out for secondary carbocations because they can rearrange. When we rearrange, we're going to move a group from, from a beta carbon. In fact, we have two beta carbons here. Beta 2 only has hydrogens. If we move a hydrogen from beta 2, we end up with a primary carbocation, and that's uphill in energy. So as a result, we're not going to move anything from beta 2. Beta 1, on the other hand, has three carbons. If one of those methyl groups shifts over, we end up with a tertiary carbocation. Our driving force is going from a secondary carbocation to a tertiary carbocation. And then this carbocation is what the bromide adds to. Giving you that product. That is all I want to cover for Monday. Problems on this are going to be in the second half of problem set 19, and that problem set will be posted. Going forward, this class is going to be more focused on online learning. So please write any questions you might have. Please go to 
the Piazza website. So please go to the Piazza website, click on follow up lecture, and then post on there. And then go ahead and add that and then post a note to that. What I will do is take a look at this, these questions on these follow-up lectures, and then craft a new lecture answering as many of these questions as I possibly can. So, best wishes, and we will get through this.